Thank you, Angela, for that uh, introduction. Uh, first of all, everyone can hear me, everyone can see me, my screen, the presentation. Uh, okay, okay, perfect. And the presentation also? Okay. Okay, so I will begin. Um, as Angela said, my name is Sushant, and today I am going to talk uh, about uh, different aspects of e-commerce operations. <clears throat> uh, so, as I understand, there have been a few other presentations in the past, and uh, other presenters have talked about other aspects of e-commerce, some, some of the introduction, introductory aspects of e-commerce, um, best practices in online shopping, how to go about selecting an e-commerce platform. And so today, so today I just want to take the conversation further. Uh, so up until now, you guys have talked about how to get online, um, how to have your business online. And today I'm going to talk about what happens after uh, a customer has placed an order. So things like warehousing, inventory management, fulfillment, um, different aspects of shipping, and some of the things that you can do around customer service and uh, unboxing experience that will help you to um, make a great uh, impression on your customer. And I think the main message that I would like you to take away from today is that if you do the different aspects of operations correctly, uh, basically you have a, a really good opportunity to build, uh, to have a great impression on, on your customer and build long-term customer loyalty and trust, uh, which is ultimately uh, in the long term, long term is going to translate into uh, positive business outcomes for your business. And at the end of the presentation, I'm going to share one case study uh, to, to really demonstrate how one company uh, utilized um, uh, the different aspects of operations and, and really focused on customer service and giving a great customer experience and really had a great success and really uh, was able to grow the business uh, quite a bit. So before I get into the topic, I just want to give a quick overview of uh, what's going on in the e-commerce industry right now. So uh, as you know, um, we were hit by COVID at the beginning of March. Um, in the last five years, e-commerce has been growing year over year uh, at a pretty steady rate and uh, taking more of the percentage of e uh, retail sales uh, every year. And different research uh, suggested that this trend is going to continue uh, you know, in the coming years also. But really something uh, interesting happened when COVID hit was uh, because of uh, business closures and everything, the shutdowns, um, businesses uh, wanted a way to reach their customers. And the way they found that is by using e-commerce and digital technologies. And so if you look at this graph, um, uh, at, at the beginning, uh, at around March, April, uh, e-commerce sales really took off. Uh, so it was more than doubled compared to previous years. And uh, so it really shows uh, how businesses adapted to uh, what happened with COVID. And all kinds of businesses were affected, uh, especially small businesses, uh, in terms of um, you know, losing revenue, uh, having to uh, lay off the employees, uh, rent deferrals, uh, finding, um, having to uh, get more credit from financial institutions to, uh, to pay for operational expenses, and so on. Uh, but even small businesses found ways to uh, to try to move towards e-commerce if they if they were uh, purely brick and mortar before, um, or even also uh, tried to leverage other d digital technologies to get online. And one of the indications of this uh, of increased adaptation of e-commerce was uh, is that uh, Shopify published in their latest uh, report. Uh, that in Q3, they had the uh, highest number ever of uh, uh, businesses uh, converting to paid customers. So that really gives an indication of, uh, you know, a lot of small businesses who were not online before moving towards e-commerce. And also, you know, some of the entrepreneurs really taking advantage of this uh, opportunity uh, that, that e-commerce has and, and really starting a new businesses. So it really gives an indication that this is a great time right now for e-commerce uh, and, and really uh, getting online. 
So today I'm going to talk about different aspects of e-commerce operations. So really what happens after a customer has made a purchase uh, on your website. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about inventory management and different aspects of that. So warehousing. Um, so warehousing, what is warehousing? Warehousing is the organization and storage of goods uh, to achieve operational efficiency. So if you're if you're a small business, you have some goods to sell to your customers uh, and you want to uh, find a way to store those goods in a way so that it's uh, efficient for you. So if a customer purchases, purchases an item from your store, you don't want to spend half an hour trying to figure out where that item is. You're storing it in a way so that you can uh, quickly ship it out to the customer. And there are different ways, uh, different types of warehouses that, that can be used. As a startup, if you're um, new to, to a business, uh, maybe you want to start off with an in-house warehouse. So maybe just use uh, space in your house or uh, some other space that you have available to store your goods. Uh, in-house warehouse is also applicable to brick and mortar stores that are already in business and they already have um, different processes set up in their business. Uh, so they may already have a warehouse space and they can all they can use that warehouse space to uh, to continue using that. Um, as different businesses grow and they uh, uh, they they grow enough that that their current needs are not meeting. Uh, a different solution is to use uh, a third party logistic solution, a fulfillment center, uh, and really start outsourcing their warehousing. So. Uh, and, and this also makes sense when you say, uh, you know, I've grown enough, I don't want to deal with the logistics side of things, so I will hand it over to a different partner uh, who can take care of that for me. Uh, some other solutions could be short-term or on-demand solutions. It really depends on what your need is. Uh, in warehousing, uh, the unit of organization is a stock keeping unit, uh, and it really helps you to, uh, to divide and, and stock your uh, items in bins and shelves and pallets and when you have a lot of items and, and you're, you're a big a bigger business then uh, a manual uh, warehousing uh, you know keeping track of things manually will not work so in that case you're going to have to find some sort of an automated solution some sort of a software uh, it's called a warehouse management system and it really helps you to uh, manage your warehouse uh, efficiently uh, to, to give you an example of um, uh, operational efficiency using warehousing, um, recently last year I visited an Amazon warehouse uh, which is not too far from where I live here and Amazon basically gives you free tours of their warehouse. Um, of course not right now but previously they were. And to show how they were achieving uh, operational efficiency, of course, when you go to their warehouse, you see a variety of different things. You see robots being used for picking items. Uh, and one of the things that they told us was uh, to achieve efficiency, one very counterintuitive thing that they do is they don't, they don't stock uh, SKUs uh, in one location. So if you have one item, one product, they wouldn't have a shelf where they have stocked you know, the same item at the same place. Uh, instead, what they do is that th this item will be uh, in random places all over the warehouse. And it's, they really keep track of it using different automated systems. And the reason they do that is really to achieve operational efficiency, uh, which is that in case, for whatever reason, if an item has a, a spike in demand, they don't want all the robots going in, in, in one place in one direction. And so uh, by, by putting items in random places, they, they make sure that you know, they're, they're achieving operational efficiency. So for every business, this is different. Of course, Amazon is a pretty big business, so they, they have found a different solutions for their warehousing. But uh, every business uh, has, to, has to find a solution that works best for them. Inventory management is about keeping track of the stocked goods. Uh, it's about monitoring how, ma how many of a certain item you have, where it is located, what are the weights and dimensions of the different items. And by, by uh, having an optimal inventory management system, you're basically trying to achieve two things. You're trying to have um, an optimal amount of products where you're, you don't have 
a lot of uh, an excess inventory, um, and at the same time, you don't have a shortage of inventory because both cases are not optimal. Uh, if you have shortage of inventory, you're going to, you know, customers are going to come to your store and, and you will end up lose, losing sales. And if you have excess inventory, then it means that your inventory is just sitting there and uh, your cash flow, uh, you know, your cash is stuck in the inventory. Uh, things may go bad uh, and, and things of that nature. So both situations, having excess inventory or having shortage of inventory are not ideal. And the whole idea of doing inventory management is to be able to manage the stock in a way so that uh, uh, it achieves operational efficiency and also uh, allows you to uh, not have your cash stuck uh, in inventory. So the last line that I've written there, money spent on inventory is money that is not spent on growth. So if you have you know, your cash stuck on inventory that is not selling, basically you're not able to use that cash for growth purposes and so that's not an optimal solution. So inventory management is actually quite a complicated topic. And here I wanted to share a few of the um, inventory management techniques with you that may help you if you're just starting out with business. It may help you, these, these different topics may help you to conceptualize, you know, what are the different techniques uh, that you can help, uh, that you can use or think about in terms of thinking about your inventory and inventory management. So the first one is uh, the idea of just-in-time inventory. And just-in-time inventory uh, was originally used for manufacturing purposes. It was uh, originated in Japan, uh, but it can be used for e-commerce. And the, the aim for this is really to cut cost, increase efficiency, decrease waste um, by receiving goods when they're needed. So the whole idea of just-in-time is that, you know, uh, as you are selling your uh, current inventory and you're running out of it, uh, you receive new uh, new shipment uh, at the exact time when you run out of your current inventory. So in this way, you basically don't have an excess of inventory and you're not um, you, you don't have a lot of cash just stuck in inventory that is not uh, selling. Of course, you know it's easier said than done. And uh, to be able to achieve this kind of you know just in time inventory efficiency, you have to rely a lot on on data and technology. So there are different pros and cons to this. The pros, uh, the advantages are that you know uh, you, you reduce storage costs, so you don't have excess in inventory, so you don't you're able to save costs there, less waste, uh, smaller inventory investment. Uh, and you have to really uh, rely on improved communication with your suppliers so that uh, you can manage uh, and achieve just-in-time inventory. The cons uh, are basically, it's a difficult system to implement and uh, there's a low margin of error. If there is something that doesn't go right, of course, you're going to run out of your inventory and uh, it will have consequences for your business. The second inventory management technique is uh, forecast demand, forecasting demand. And basically the idea here is that if you want to manage your inventory uh, in an efficient man manner, one of the best things that you can do is find a way to forecast what your demand is going to be, uh, you know, week per week, month per month, uh, and so on. And if you know, uh, if you're able to accurately forecast what your demand is going to be, of course, you, you can order inventory in, in, in the right manner and, and you'll be able to achieve a good efficiency in that way. Of course, forecasting future is not easy. It's a difficult uh, process. You have to rely a lot on data. One of the ways to do it is by looking at last year for last year's volumes. So you know how much you sent uh, um, sold last year and that can give you an indication of uh, what you're going to sell this year, depending on different factors like economic factors, market conditions, growth rate of your business, uh, seasonality, geographic considerations. You can uh, try to anticipate what kind of marketing campaigns you want to run. And based on all these different factors, you can try to forecast uh, what your demand is going to be. And based on that, you place your order uh, up front. Of course, again, you know, this is forecasting is a difficult method. And, and uh, as a startup, if you don't, uh, if you don't have uh, data from pre previous years, uh, you have to find some way uh, to, to try to uh, figure out or try to predict 
what your demand is going to be. Maybe you look at uh, other businesses in your mar uh, in your industry. Uh, you have to do some research uh, to find sales data and things like that to try to predict that. And so, if you can, if you have a good idea of your demand, then uh, you you'll you'll be able to manage your inventory properly. The other way to manage your inventory is to have triggers um, in your management process where uh, a system tells you, you know, when is the right time for you to order a certain product, uh, uh, and and that can help you to make sure that you never you have the optimal levels of inventory in your business. Here I have uh, I've listed three different measures um, or, or triggers that that give you that kind of information. So the first one is set par levels, which is basically minimum quantity of a product that should be on hand at, at all times. So if you decide that product A, you should always have 50 of that no matter what in your uh, warehouse. Um, then as, as your inventory is achieving, uh, is reaching uh, 50, you know that now it's time to uh, place an order. Uh, the second one is safety stock. It's basically uh, another measure you, you want to have a certain amount of stock for emergency purposes at all times uh, stocked in your uh, warehouse. Finally, uh, the third one is called reorder point. It's also another trigger. Uh, it's the level at, at which it's time to replenish stock. So all these different triggers, I don't want to get into the different formulas and things like that, but if you think about it, if you uh, are a startup and you only have a few products, you can probably do some manual processes. You can use Excel and try to manage your inventory and you know have a good idea on when you have to order a, um, uh, a new batch of items. But as you continue to grow or as you have more products uh, uh, in your business, uh, manual uh, manual management is not going to work. At that point, you have to use some sort of an automation or some sort of a software to be able to manage these things. Because otherwise you'll be spending too much time on just managing your inventory and you won't be able to focus on growth activities and things like that. Um, another management technique is to take more of a prioritization approach. So uh, something called an ABC analysis. And you look at, you know, if you have 10 products that you sell, you look at which are the products that, are, uh, that result in 80% of your revenue. And uh, based on that, you focus more on those products, those few products that, that, uh, that are responsible for most of your revenues, and then you can give lower priority, priority to other products. And again, the idea here is to achieve operational efficiency uh, to, uh, to, be, to be able to uh, be efficient in, in managing your inventory. This method is contingency planning. Um, and this is really about planning uh, on in what happens in an uh, in an un unexpected situation. So, let's say that you know sales spike for whatever reason, or you have a shortfall of cash, or something happened in the warehouse. Um, you know, maybe an item that you don't sell very well is taking a lot of space in the warehouse. Um, if there's an issue with the manufacturer, maybe manufacturer is no longer producing the item that you sell or the manufacturer goes out of business. So it's really about, you know, in your business, thinking about these kind of situations, uh, unexpected situations and planning for it beforehand uh, or ahead of time. Um, and it will help you to uh, manage your inventory and, and figure out ways in which, uh, you, know, it, you know, these unexpected things uh, may not negatively affect your business. So it's really about uh, thinking ahead. Uh, the next one is auditing. Um, I think every business has to do auditing um, at certain times. Um, auditing is really about reconciling the inventory that you have in your electronic systems, however you're managing your inventory, um, you know, in Excel or if you have some soft software, uh, and, and what is the, the, the reality in your warehouse. So it's really about saying, okay, my, my, my records show that I have uh, an item A, I should have 50 items, and then going in the warehouse and, and counting that item and seeing if it's the right number of items. 
Uh, and if there are di discrepancies, then it gives you an idea. You have to think about what happened. Why is there a discrepancy? Is there, uh, you know, some process that is broken, or is is there uh, someone is stealing my item, or is you know different things that may happen. Uh, there are different frequencies or different ways that you can audit your inventory. The first one is physical inventory. So usually uh, it's done at the end of every year. You you go to your warehouse and you do a full count of all your inventory and then reconcile it against your uh, records. The second one is spot checking where this kind of a supplement, supplemental uh, inventory checking where you look at your problematic or fast moving products and uh, and keep an eye on you know if if uh, the reality matches with what's what is on the books and the third one is cycle counting where you are um, doing the reconciliation of some products every month and you do it throughout the year the next method is relationship management and this is also very very important um, ultimately you will be able to manage your uh, inventory in the best way when you have great relationships with your suppliers, your manufacturers. And so, because th they are the ones who are shipping out the items to you. So if you have great communication, great, great relationships with them, then, uh, you know, hopefully that process will be more, a lot more efficient. So in this aspect, you want to think of your manufacturers and suppliers as partners in your business. And you want to have always have really clear and proactive communication and expectations with them. So it's really a two way street. Um, you know, uh, you have to think about what is important to them. Maybe the most important thing to them is getting paid on time. And so you want to make sure that, you know, what they what they, their expectation is, you're fulfilling that. And so in return, uh, they will help you in, in managing your inventory properly. And one of the important things here is that you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. So if you have like one main supplier that, that supplies all your products that you're selling, so again, you think about the contingency situation. What if something unexpected happens and you're not able to order the item from that supplier? Uh, that will have a huge negative impact on your business. So thinking about these kind of things is very important to make sure that uh, your business is running smoothly. Finally, um, as I mentioned before, uh, when you are small, when you're a startup or you have only a few products, it's, it'll be easier to manage your inventory um, manually or more of an Excel approach. Um, but as you're growing, as, you, as your business is growing or you have more and more products um, uh, in your business, then you would need to have uh, some sort of an automated system, some sort of a software that can help you to manage your inventory uh, and and make sure that you're not spending a, you know, a huge amount of, of your time just you know managing inventory and warehouse and uh, you're not you're not able to devote time towards business growth because that's not going to be helpful. Um, these days, uh, inventory management systems are usually available with the e-commerce platform that you're going to use. So any platform like Shopify or BigCommerce, any of these platforms that are available in the market usually have uh, some sort of an inventory management system built in. Um, they also make it available so that you can easily integrate a third-party inventory management system. Um, and these systems really help you to uh, manage your inventory, even if you have uh, your inventory located in different warehouses and uh, and different places, uh, you can have a central management of the inventory. And again, the whole idea is to increase efficiency uh, and save money. And usually these inventory management systems uh, not only just help you managing your inventory, they have a variety of built-in tools like reporting, uh, they, 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 they give you triggers on when to uh, you know, what is the right time to order stock and things like that. So it's, it's really great to, to, to be able to use the systems and to manage your inventory. Similarly, you can, um, you know, the, the platforms also integrate with accounting systems and uh, your inventory, uh, the different aspects of your business, uh, you know, in terms of tax, taxes, inventory, um, you know, cost of goods sold, uh, also integrate with different accounting systems. And it's, it's useful to have this in terms of reconciliation purposes to see, you know, what is, uh, 
you know, what, what is the report that you're getting from your accounting system in, in terms of your inventory reports, uh, different financial reports, and, and what is the reality. So it helps you to uh, reconcile your inventory with your accounting. And again, um, the, the different e-commerce platforms that are available in the market, they, they now usually do have uh, the ability to uh, easily integrate with different systems. So it, it really makes it easy for you to manage things. So you don't really have to rely on manual management. So now we've talked about warehousing, we've talked about inventory management. The next part, um, I'm going to talk about e-commerce fulfillment. So uh, what happens after a customer has placed an order, now you have to, uh, the fulfillment is the process to take the item from your warehouse and now get, get it into the hands of the customer. So fulfillment is the process of preparing and delivering a customer's order, which is really about picking the item from your warehouse, packing it, shipping it out, and then the ability to, to track it. And there are three main uh, methods, three, three main options in the e-commerce world. Uh, the first one is drop shipping. Then you have in-house fulfillment and third-party logistics, and I'm going to talk each of the, about each of them here. So, what is drop shipping? Drop shipping is the um, a, the simplest e-commerce business model, um, but you know it may not be the best one uh, for a variety of reasons, and and I'll show you the different advantages and disadvantages of drop shipping. Uh, basically, what happens in drop shipping is you open a business, you create an e-commerce business, you list different products in the business, you do marketing, and when the customer comes to your site, they may place an order, you're responsible for pricing, and once the order is placed, uh, you don't manage the, the, the item, you don't manage the physical inventory. Basically, you have built partnerships with manufacturers and wholesalers, and you transfer the order either manually or automatically to the manufacturer or the wholesaler, and they're the ones who take the inventory out of their warehouse, ship, uh, uh, pack it, and ship it out to the customer. So it's a, it's a very simple model. You know, you don't, you don't have to deal with the inventory, so, so there are different advantages to that. Um, of course, the first one is you don't need a lot of startup capital if, because you don't have to buy uh, any product. And so it's easy to get started. Uh, it's low overhead for your business. You can run it from anywhere. Um, you can also, there is no limit to the number of products that you can list on your website because you don't have to have inventory. And one big advantage of this is that if you have listed a lot of different products on your website, it's, you know, over time, it, you'll, you'll get a good idea of which products are actually selling and which, were, which ones are not selling. And so, Eventually down the road, if you want to say that, you know, I want to actually have a physical product business, I want to buy the product, uh, maybe create your own brand, uh, you will have a good idea in terms of data uh, to know which products actually sell in the marketplace. Now, dropshipping, as I said before, it's not the best business model out there. There are definitely a lot of disadvantages. Uh, it's low margins um, because, you know, you're only marketing your products. The real uh, people who have the product and who are shipping it out are the, the manufacturers and wholesalers. So you really get very low margins uh, on the sale. Uh, the, the other big disadvantage of this model is that um, you have, you're relying a lot on the manufacturer and the wholesaler. So as I said before, you know, the whole idea of looking at the different aspects of operations is that ultimately, you want to uh, please the customer. You want to make the customer happy uh, by quickly and efficiently getting the, the, the products that they have ordered uh, and accurately uh, in their hands. And when you're relying on a third party to do that process for you, uh, there could be a lot of different things uh, that can happen. And because they're the third party, they don't really care about your business. Uh, you know, there's greater chances of errors and so, at the end of the day, because it, the customer is yours, the customer is going to come to you if something, uh, you know, either they receive the wrong product or th the shipping is late or, you know, variety of number of things that, that may happen, uh, the, the customer is going to be unhappy with you. Uh, so that's, that's a really big um, uh, disadvantage of this model. So <clears throat> 
it's a good way to test the uh, test the market but uh, maybe no, maybe not a great business model for long term so in terms of fulfillment this is a model where uh, you're not uh, you you're taking more of a hands off approach to fulfillment you do, you're not dealing with the fulfillment you're just managing your business the second option is in house fulfillment so this is more relevant to startups or also brick and mortar stores that uh, that already have uh, warehouse and they have different processes this is where you know if as a startup if you have low order volumes basically when you get an order you take the item from your you know maybe home warehouse you put it in a box yeah, you know you you package it up you take it to uh, a shipping service provider and you ship it out to the to the customer uh, in the other situation, if you are a brick and mortar store and you, you, you're you new to e-commerce, you may already have a warehouse, you may already have the different processes. So it may make sense for you to simply hire a person who, who will do order management or, or, or order fulfillment for you and they can uh, you know pack and ship the items to the customer. Um, this also works if a product has, the product that you're selling has special packaging needs that can't be handled by a third person. So you really need to package your product in a certain way. Uh, so in that case, also in-house fulfillment is a better option. Finally, um, the last fulfillment option uh, is third-party logistics. And this is the, the option where you are basically saying, uh, I'm not going to take care of the logistics myself. I'm just going to let someone else who specializes in uh, logistics uh, and fulfillment uh, take care of that for me. I'm just going to pay them a certain fees and let them do, it, uh, do this for me. And the reason for this is uh, third-party logistics, uh, they specialize on the fulfillment processes, so they're working with a lot of different businesses. So they have really uh, focused on building uh, different infrastructure, uh, technologies, uh, and, and so they can really be uh, very efficient in terms of fulfilling your order for you. And then in this situation, basically you say, I, I'm just going to focus on um, building my business, growing my business, marketing, business development, these kind of activities, and let the specialists deal with the fulfillment processes. Um, I'm okay to pay them certain fees for that. So <clears throat> third-party logistics, this is really about outsourcing your fulfillment and uh, because of their expertise, they can bring a lot of value in terms of economies of scale, uh, in terms of uh, you know having uh, lower costs in terms of shipping and things like that because, because of higher volume, they have negotiated better prices with shipping service providers uh, and so on. And so uh, in this situation, if you do it right and you have the right uh, third-party logistics uh, partner. Uh, basically, in that situation, you can just focus on your business, focus on growing, growing your business, and let the uh, your partner handle the fulfillment processes. Now, the most important thing in this is is to be able to choose the right uh, third-party 3PL partner for your business if you're going to be successful doing this, um, and because not all third-party logistics uh, may suit your business and your business needs. So you have to be really clear about you know what your product is, what are the special needs of your products, what are the special needs of your business, and then really go and interview different third-party logistics providers and see which one can really meet your need in terms of um, packing, shipping, returns, um, if, if you have special packaging, um, uh, and and different different providers have different expertise in different industries also, and and then the, there are other aspects that you want to see that you know they have the right technology they can give you the right reports that you're looking for, uh, maybe you don't have long term commitments, so choosing the right partner is really the most important aspect of uh, finding the the right three uh, pl uh, doing three pl right. Um, in my own experience, I have. Um, I've heard of different horror stories where, uh, you know, people, uh, businesses end up choosing the right partner and, 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 uh, and what ends up happening is again, because you're relying on a third party and the third party is not, uh, you know, invested in your business, 
then they're giving a poor customer experience in terms of you know the items that they're shipping out maybe there are errors in that maybe they're shipping it out late uh, it's not there's no uh, good returns pro processes uh, things are falling under the cracks so ultimately what ends up happening if you're if you're not choosing the right partner your customers are going to be the ones that are going to suffer and ultimately they're going to be unhappy with your business so it can have by you know if you choose the wrong partner it can really have a, a negative impact on your business so those were the three fulfillment methods uh, now i'm going to talk about uh, e-commerce shipping and the different uh, how to go about uh, creating a shipping strategy for your business yes Yeah, so just in time is yeah. So so just 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 in time inventory management uh, is is one example of how to go about doing uh, inventory management. Again, um, the idea with inventory management is to have have your process so efficient that as soon as you are running out of your current inventory you have already placed an order uh, for your for, for the for, for new inventory and uh, all the time that it takes in between for the order to be um, either manufactured or shipped uh, you know if it's coming from either domestically or internationally uh, you are keeping uh, in, into account all that time so that as as you are running out of your current inventory you're uh, you're receiving the new stock and so you're not uh, you know, there's never a, a situation where um, you have too much stock so that you have too much cash stuck in, in, in inventory or that, you know, you have uh, a lot of inventory just sitting on, on the shelves. And, and the second situation also, you know, you're not running out of stock where um, you don't have items. So customers are placing order on your website, but you don't have enough items so that you can uh, fulfill them. So both situations are bad. Um, how can it be helpful? I think that's, that's, uh, that's the whole point of it is to achieve operational efficiency. Um, you can do it manually. Of course, you have to be very, if you're doing it manually, then you have to be very, uh, keep an eye on, on the inventory levels and you have to have a way of different triggers uh, informing you when is the right time to order the inventory. Um, but of course, you know, if you have an automated solution, a software that can help you to do that uh, much more effectively. So it's just one example. Their inventory management is a, a complex topic and, you know, the complexity increases as you have more uh, products and, and, you know, uh, and every product has different needs, different uh, demands. So, um, so it's really about, you know, automating it and, and uh, you know, finding people who are specialists in this thing to be able to manage your inventory. And so that's that's one of the main reasons why when businesses become larger, instead of doing in-house fulfillment, instead of managing everything themselves, because if you're trying to manage uh, inventory yourself, then you have to build all the infrastructure yourself. You know, you have to find uh, the right technology, you have to find the right software, you have to find the right people, who can do the management for you. Um, rather, what a lot of people do, a lot of businesses do, is they go and go to the specialist. So that's where you have these third party uh, providers uh, who specialize in and who, who have already built all the different infrastructure. They can really bring their technology, their ex expertise, their infrastructure to help you to manage that effectively. So I don't know if that answers your questions. Did, did you have like any specific?
So, so if you think about, you know, let's say, let's say you're starting a new business, okay? So instead of looking at the formula, let's think about it more conceptually, okay? And then I can maybe look at one of these formulas here. So if, let's say that you want to, um, you have a product A, right? And your manufacturer or your supplier is, let's say, sitting in China, okay? So think about, you know, one, what, what happens when you place an order. Uh, and and what what different steps that that would require? So, if you, if you're placing an order from a Chinese manufacturer, of course you know you are going to communicate them in a certain way. Uh, that may take some time. You know you're going to email them because of time differences and 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 you know geographical differences. There may be a few days that may take for them to get back to you. They, they, you know there may be some communication back and forth you know, in, in in terms of confirming things, confirming. Uh, different, uh, you know, payment terms and those kind of things. So that may take some time. Uh, then from there, they may not be ready to manufacture your pro uh, your product. So it may take them some time uh, to to actually because they they may be manufacturing other products. So so it may take them some time to actually manufacture the your product your order. Uh, and so this is this this whole time before you know when when you place an order to when they are ready to ship your uh, your um, items. This is called lead time. Okay, so this is the the the, the time between placing an order and, and receiving, basically them being ready to to ship it out to you. Then the next step, if you think about it, is they are using some sort of a shipping service, whether it's an ocean freight or air freight. They ship it out. Then in your country, there will be some sort of a custom process where the items are stuck in customs. You have to do certain custom processes to get, get the item um, out of the customs. So, so the whole process, if you think about it, there, there are many, many different steps to it. And there are many places where if things didn't work out properly, there's chances for things to be delayed. Okay. So when you're, when you're thinking about this whole process of inventory management, you have to think about, you know, what is the total time that it takes? after you place an order for for the new stock to come in and you and at the same time you have to keep into account uh chances for things to go wrong right if if things uh, did not so, something happen and um there's a delay and and if you haven't if you don't have a safety stock or you don't have some stock sitting in your warehouse what will happen is because of this delay you will run out of the stock and there will be a period where you're going to lose uh, you know your your website will say the item out of stock, and so so this is the whole idea of you know these different triggers. So if you think about this, uh, you know, reorder point uh, calculation that is here, it, it basically says uh, reorder point equals lead time demand plus safety stock. So you are you are keeping into time into uh, uh, you're factoring what that lead time is, and you know the safety stock. So as as soon as let's say your safety stock for an item is 50 items, uh, you say that okay, I know that the lead time usually is, you know, 30 days, and in 30 days I, I um, you know, I I sell 100 of this item, so 100 plus your safety stock 150. So that is the reorder point, meaning that as soon as your stock hits 150, you know that it's now it's time to to place the order. So it's really, um, you know, there, this is only one calculation. There are different triggers that could be built in uh, based on the product, based on the different um, requirements that are, that are um, uh, so not every product could, you know, could follow the same shipping uh, pattern. So it, it, then th that's where an automated system can be useful where uh, on a product level you can, you can build different rules that helps you to manage the stocks of those different products effectively. Uh, does that does does that help? Okay.
Což Okay. So yeah, in the next topic I'm going to talk about shipping and different aspects of shipping, how you can create your shipping strategy, what are the different cost considerations, um and uh, you know, then I will also talk about uh, returns. But again, here there is no one uh one one uh, you know, one um one way of doing things, right? every business every product uh you will have to based on what your unique requirements are will have to come up with a different shipping strategy that would work for your business and uh hopefully by the different things that i talk about here you will be able to create a a strategy that will work best for your business so to show you the important of importance of shipping in an e-commerce business uh this is a um, a chart that was published by Canada Post they did a uh, a survey uh and uh, they asked uh the participants the you know different customers of e-commerce businesses you know what are the different factors that are important that really drive consumers choice of online retailers so when people are shopping um you know w- what differentiates where where they shop um as opposed to where they will not shop and what they found was five of the top uh, eight factors uh were related to shipping and returns okay so and that really tells you how important shipping is for an e-commerce business so the most important factor was offering free shipping so you know if uh, if a business offers free shipping uh it really helps them drive sales um expectations around delivery so you know when a person is checking out do they know what the delivery date is going to be uh return policy of course it helps when especially when you know in situations where a person cannot touch and feel uh the item like in terms of apparel and shoes and those kind of things um any place a, a, a business can offer faster shipping that helps them to drive sales and uh, overall uh a convenient delivery experience uh will also help customers to 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 prefer a, a retailer over a, a different retailer so hopefully that this gives you an idea that you know what are the different factors around shipping that really help drive sales and what happens a lot of times and you may you know everyone these days have done some sort of e-commerce shopping uh is when you're shopping you're you're uh, you know shopping at a e-commerce store at a certain point if you realize that you know either the return policy is not clear or you you think that the shipping costs are too high uh, it usually leads to customer leaving the website and uh, that is called an abandoned cart uh, basically what happens is uh, you lost the sale and the customer goes and finds a different retailer and purchases the item from there so it's really important to have the right shipping strategy again with the goal in mind to 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 drive the customer loyalty and customer trust and 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 uh, making the customer happy and if you if you get it right it it helps in driving your business in terms of it you will get more conversions more sales higher average order values um expanding market so you know you you'll have more people buying from you decreasing costs and improving operational efficiency so e-commerce shipping is a balance always a balance between cost and customer experience right so shipping is never free someone shipping is costly and someone has to pay for shipping right either it is the business either it is the the customer who's shopping or they share the cost you know partially uh, within themselves and uh, for a business uh, if it is a business that is uh, taking on the cost it it can be a major expense and uh, as i said before if it's not done correctly it will lead to cart abandonment poor shopping experience for the customer uh, if a customer has a poor shopping experience they will likely not return uh, to uh, to shop again from your store so it it really has long term consequences for the business um one important thing with the shipping is that if you have large volumes and as you grow as your volume uh, of shipments grow uh, that helps you to Uh, negotiate better discounts from shipping providers so that's an important factor uh or 
you're working with a fulfillment center that has a larger volume, so they have already negotiated better prices. Uh, in that in that case, also you can get better prices. Um, one of the most important factors when it comes to shipping and returns is to have really transparent policies on your website and and setting clear expectations. So it is one thing for a business to charge full price for the shipping uh, uh, from the customer, but as as long as they're making all these uh, their policies and you know their their uh, expectations clear and upfront, that that in a way helps to build trust in the mind of the customer, right? So if your return policy is that you 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 know you're not going to expect uh, accept return after you know ten days, and if you if you have actually made it really really clear in the shopping uh, journey, then the customer knows that. And so they have clear expectations. And so hopefully that will not create a negative shopping experience for them. A lot of time what happens is, uh, you know, businesses have not made these policies and expectations clear. And so, uh, so you know, if a customer is, has bought something and they want to return it, and then it comes as a surprise for them that, you know, they've, uh, gone out of their uh, you know return window then it creates a new, really negative experience for the customer um, so really having the uh, the right policies and clear expectations is very important um, and finally uh, choosing the right shipping service can also define su success and as i was saying before uh, not all services are uh, are equal in terms of you know your business may have some special needs your products may have some special needs and so some some shipping providers may be better at dealing with those needs so it's really about choosing the right provider that will uh, really uh, be a partner for your success so building your shipping strategy as i was saying before you know someone has to pay for the shipping costs it could be the customer it could be the business it could be you know uh, both of them uh, pay partially and to figure out what that you know what that right level is for your business you can do some sort of a financial analysis you can list out the different costs you know cost of the product packaging what is the shipping cost um, you know how much profit margin you want to make on your product and based on that it may help you to set the right price for your product or it may help you to decide you know how much uh, of the shipping cost you want to bear as opposed to you know how much you want to pass to the customer so a financial analysis can always help um, one thing uh, in a lot of startup situations um, it is suggested you know a, a best practice is because you know most of the customers uh, prefer free shipping is to build build in the cost of shipping in the in the uh, in the price of the product and that usually helps to give customer the impression that you know they're paying free, free shipping even though it is part of the uh, part of the cost of the product. Uh, it is easier to do that um, when you have your own branded product rather than if you're selling someone else's product. And you know there are many retailers in the market that are selling the same product. Uh, then it will be easier because there will always be other retailers then that you know can sell it for a lower price. But if you have created your own brand, if you have your own branded uh, item, it's, it helps a little bit in terms of, because you're then responsible for your own pricing. Um, and so it, it helps a little bit in terms of uh, working with the different, different options. So shipping strategy, there could be different shipping strategies. You can um, go for free shipping. You could basically um, bear the entire shipping cost yourself and as you saw before in the chart before you know that may help you to drive more conversions more sales uh, and and if you do a financial analysis maybe that is a, a worthwhile uh, option for you to pursue uh, the other option is real-time quotes so when when the customer is going through the checkout process basically they get real-time quotes from the shipping provider so the shipping provider has a has some sort of a, uh, integration with your e-commerce platform and that uh, you know you get real-time quotes uh, in this situation a lot of the times uh, the customer will also see, see different shipping speeds so the customer has the option to choose the the right 
shipping speed for them. And uh, basically in that situation, the customer is paying uh, for the cost of the shipping. The third situation could be flat rate where you say that you are going to bear certain cost of the shipping, but the customer has to pay a certain flat rate. This may work better, better in situations where you have a pretty standardized uh, set of products, uh, you know, in terms of volume and weight, because shipping is really dependent on, on volume and weight uh, factors. So if you have a standardized group of products where the volume and weight of products are pretty standard, uh, then it may be useful for you to give a flat uh, shipping rate kind of a, an option. Then you can also think about local shipping. Uh, so these days, uh, buy online pickup and store is very popular, at least with the bigger retailers. If you have your uh, shop uh, available in different places, you can always give this option. Uh, the other option is curbside pickup. Uh, some businesses, um, if they, if, you know, if, if it's a brick and mortar store and you have the resources available, you can also uh, use your own trucks, your own vehicle to to sh uh, to ship out or deliver products uh, locally. Finally, international shipping. I'm going to talk a little bit about international sh shipping uh, in one of the next slides. Shipping speeds, there are different shipping speeds available. And of course, uh, the faster a shipment is going to be, usually the, the, the more expensive option it's going to be. Now, for some businesses, you have to, um, uh, you have to provide faster shipping options just because of the nature of the product. Um, you know, so if, if it's a perishable product or something like that, then maybe you, you have to uh, use a faster uh, shipping speed uh, and, and that will be a part of your strategy. Usually now nowadays, uh, the two most uh, frequently found shipping speeds are either the standard shipping, which is five to seven business days, or the two day shipping, which is uh, popularized by Amazon Prime. Uh, so usually, uh, you know, uh, people are now more and more beginning to expect faster shipping. Uh, and as you saw in, in the survey, uh, that, that does have an impact on people's choice of the retailer. So shipping costs, uh, there are different costs that go into shipping. Uh, it could uh, be the, the package type. So if you're using a box, a uh, box may be more uh, heavier, it may have a larger volume, as opposed to if you use a poly mailer, that may be a little bit less expensive. The size and weight of the package uh, has an effect on the cost of the shipment. So is the origin origin and destination address. So usually the, the farther uh, the destination, uh, the higher the cost is going to be. Uh, and this is the reason people also use third-party logistics because um, a lot of the times the third-party logistics have different warehouses uh, in a country and uh, your stock is distributed in different warehouses and when a customer places an order, the order is shipped out from the warehouse that is closest to that address and that helps you to reduce the shipping costs. Uh, packaging costs. Uh, the kind of package that you're using, uh, the resources that go into uh, picking and packing, th those those may be different um, considerations. Uh, if the item is being shipped locally, nationally, internationally, um, and finally, the higher the volume that you have, usually you can uh, negotiate better discounts with shipping providers. So choosing the right shipping service in Canada uh, the three big shipping providers um, in e-commerce space are, you know, Canada Post, UPS, and FedEx. And uh, there may be other uh, uh, third-party providers that work with the, with these providers, but they're working with a lot of different businesses, so they have a higher volume, so, so they have negotiated uh, better shipping prices with these providers. So, you know, there may be uh, businesses like that also. There, are, I know that there are a lot of these in the U.S. I'm not sure... Uh, I'm sure, you know, there may be some in Canada also. Uh, so when you're choosing the right shipping service, again, you uh, the important thing is to see if your product, if the kind of product that, that you're selling has any special requirements. You know, some, some shipping providers have uh, size and weight restrictions. So if you have a really heavy product or a really large product, you want to see which 
a shipping provider works best with the, with those kind of things. Um, delivery times, which shipping provider is able to um, offer faster service at a lower cost. Uh, tracking services. Uh, tracking is a very important factor to be able to see where the, the item is and the customer also wants to see, uh, where, you know, be able to track uh, the location of the item. So which shipping pr service provides tracking services. Um, the ability to create business accounts. So as a business, you will get uh, more savings in, in, in shipping services as opposed to if you just uh, take your product uh, as, a, as a personal uh, shipment uh, to the post office and want to ship it like that, that will be always be uh, a higher cost. Now, one one thing that you always have to keep in mind that, uh, you know, any high volume retailers shipping is uh, kind of uh, creates a competition. So if you're selling a commodity product and uh, there's another retailer that is a high volume retailer, maybe they'll be able to offer free shipping uh, to, to ship that item, whereas you are not able to do that. So that's definitely a a... Uh, a, a competing factor uh, in that situation. And, and that's the reason, you know, most of the small businesses these days are competing with Amazon and some of these high volume retailers. And so the strategy that a lot of the, these uh, in, in such situations that small businesses use is they try to uh, value add in other ways. So they may say that, you know, Amazon, uh, you, you know, maybe you as a small business can provide a more educational approach or a better customer service that helps the customer in making the purchase. Uh, so that becomes kind of a value add for the customer. So they're, they're, they're happy to ship from you even though they have to pay shipping. So that is kind of a strategy to compete with um, big retailers like Amazon, um, and which a lot of businesses use. Uh, and that's also one of the reasons why branded products uh, work better in terms of competing with uh, retailers like Amazon and always negotiate f fees with the shipping services. Um, they're happy to uh, give better and they have programs to provide better shipping cost to cost to businesses. Uh, insurance and tracking is very important, um, especially if you have uh, a product that is expensive. Uh, you want to have some sort of insurance because uh, if, if it gets lost in the mail, then uh, insurance helps in 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 um, giving you a little bit of security and peace of mind. <clears throat> Tracking also is always very important, both for the business and the customer, to be able to see where exactly the package package is. Um, Tracking also helps in terms of you know if a package gets lost or damaged, uh, or in situation of you know customer saying that they did not receive the item, or they're saying you know they have made a chargeback claim. So the tracking. Uh, you know, whatever financial institution you're working with, they're, they're going to ask for you for your tracking number. And if, if you have that, then uh, there are better chances that you'll be covered uh, for the charge. Uh, some shipping services offer complimentary insurance up to $100. So always, uh, you know, when you're talking to, when you're uh, finding out the right shipping partner for yourself, always ask, you know, if they have some complimentary uh, insurance uh, coverage and uh, yeah, as I said, uh, insurance is especially useful if you have like more expensive items. International shipping. Um, so international shipping is, is definitely useful as you are growing. Uh, as, you, um, as you're growing your business, you want to access new markets. Uh, for Canadian businesses, of course, you know, US uh, is, is the first option. U.S. has about 10 times bigger market than Canada, so it's you know, cross-border. It gives you easy access to a bigger market. Um, <clears throat> you can also check your analytics to see if there are other places that uh, where, the, where the traffic is coming from. Uh, and also, you can look at customer service requests to see uh, if people from other countries are, uh, you know, if there's a demand for your product in other countries and other places. Uh, Always a good idea to start small and and then build from there. So if, if you are building an international strategy, uh, you know, always always good to start with uh, one new 
country rather than just going after 10 new countries because that will be difficult to ma manage uh, see if there's a product market fit there's uh, you know uh, what languages you are uh, comf comfortable communicating with um, if your product let's say that you're, you're s selling something that is um, that is applicable to places that, that has um, that have beaches then you can safely assume that other places in the world that have beaches may also have demand for your kind of product so that may be one way to figure out you know which which markets to track um, target and it's always easier to work with lightweight and smaller items because lightweight and smaller items are usually easier to ship even internationally so a lot of the times um, you'll see when you're trying to start a business and trying to brainstorm uh, ideas for new businesses it's always desirable to start with like a lightweight and smaller item Yeah, so it's it's always like when you're when you're trying to find ideas for your business um, when you're researching make a list of based on your research you know which what are the different items that you want to sell and and you have to prioritize and, and figure out um, which would be the best item to sell usually if an item a consideration that a lot of people you'll see um, online also suggesting that one of the um, good criteria is to start off with something small because then you're automatically reducing your shipping costs and it's easier to manage easier to store easier to warehouse uh, and uh, so usually that works out better as as a e-commerce business uh, then you know once you have more experience with the e-commerce you can add more products uh, bigger products and uh, that that may help you grow from there so if you don't have any other questions, maybe I can continue. Okay, so <clears throat> in terms of cross-border and international shipping, uh, there, there's other considerations also that you have to keep in mind. So many countries have different rules and regulations around importing. Uh, you also also have to check, you know, if the product that you're selling uh, is not considered a hazardous material or dangerous good or it's fragile, then you will have different um, requirements in terms of shipping. There may be more complexities. Uh, you have to see what kind of custom forms and documentations you have to take care of to do international shipping. Um, then you have to find out the different costs and delivery option for international shipping. Of course, it's international shipping usually costs uh, a lot more than domestic shipping. Uh, and in that case, uh, tracking and insurance uh, becomes even more important uh, because there's greater chances of losing your item internationally. Um, again, you want to have very, uh, very good good transparency around different fee fees and delivery expectations and return policies when it comes to international shipping because uh, things are always more complicated um, uh, in terms of delivery expect expectations uh, an international package is always going to take more time to deliver and that's always uh, good to note uh, on your website in your policies and and uh, and things like that that if, if someone is ordering uh, internationally 
you know you want to give a, a wider window for for delivery so that the customer has uh, expectations around that um, there's usually also uh, tariffs and duties and taxes additional taxes and and duties that the receiving country may have that the customer may, may customer may be responsible for um, it's always good to have clear expectations around those fees who will be responsible for for those fees uh, so uh, delivery duty paid would be uh, the, the 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 shipper has already taken into account into all the costs and fees uh, and 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 it's already paid so the customer does not have to pay anything extra when they receive the item uh, as opposed to the other option delivery duty unpaid uh, when the customer receives the item at their location uh, uh, they may have to pay some extra fees to the shipping service in order to get that item and again it's it's very important to have clear expectations around these fees uh, so that there's no uh, surprises uh, to give you an example uh, a few days ago a few months ago i ordered a pair of shoes uh, and it was coming from i think uh, i had placed an order from the U u.s site the item actually came came from uk and when i went to pick up the item uh, at canada post uh, they basically said you have to pay additional 50 or 60 dollars and uh, that came as a surprise to me and uh, uh, because nowhere on the website they had mentioned that anywhere uh, if it was clearly visible on the website that I may I would have to pay extra fees when I receive the item, then it may have uh, you know changed my uh, buying decision. I would not have bought it, but because it was a surprise for me, I ended up uh, not accepting that item, and and they had to basically ship uh, ship it back to the uh, uh, to the retailer. And in that case, if you think about it, what ended up happening is the 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 uh, the shipper actually ended up losing the, the shipping cost uh, for that item. So it was actually a negative for them uh, in terms of uh, money. And uh, it also created a, a poor customer experience for me. Now I'm, I'm, you know, I don't think I'll ever go and purchase uh, anything from that site again. So it's very, very important to have clear expectations. Uh, shipping workflow. So, uh, when, when you're shipping um, and you're growing as a business, as you will get more products and more volume, uh, more orders, uh, you want to ha build a, a workflow that, that works in terms of, you know, you able to quickly ship out the item to the customer. You don't want to be in a situation where, uh, you know, you're spending too much time just shipping out the items every single day and you have no time to work on business development or marketing and those kind of things. And uh, the e-commerce platforms these days, like Shopify and BigCommerce, etc., cetera, um, have good workflows built into them. So they do make it easier for businesses to, uh, to, to, to have this workflow where they can quickly print out uh, shipping labels and things like that and ship out the item. So you, al you always want to find ways to optimize this shipping process. And uh, ultimately, you know, if, uh, uh, as you are growing more and more, maybe the solution is that you have to hire uh, additional resources who will uh, do the shipping full time for you, or you may start exploring third party logistics options and really start outsourcing your uh, fulfillment processes. So now I'm going to talk about returns a little bit. Returns are also very, very um, important factor in an e-commerce business especially because uh, in an e-commerce situation you're not able to see the item uh, you know uh, uh, in person you're not able to touch it you're not able to try it on and so return is does make a huge um, uh, huge part of running an e-commerce business uh, now some industries and some businesses of course will have higher return rates than others so if you think about you know anything like apparel or shoes or anything where a, p a customer wants to try it on uh, before buying it because in an e-commerce situation they're not able to do that um, they were, there will always be um, higher return rates in, the, in those situations no, now what happens in the return situation is that um, someone has to pay for return shipping 
and and uh, either it's the customer or the shipper uh, so there is a cost uh, involved in that uh, and so you have to decide as a business and you have to do some sort of a financial analysis to figure out you know what is the what, what is the most financially feasible uh, option for your business uh, again it's it's always better to have transparent return policies on the website so if you have a 30 day return policy uh, it's it's always good to make it really really clear if you have any additional requirements like you don't you don't want the product to be used or you want the product to be in its original packaging conditions or you if you have restocking fees those kind of different factors <clears throat> you always want to make sure that it's very very transparent on the business because again you don't want to surprise the customer um, in terms of return strategies again um, it really would depend on your business and what you are comfortable with in terms of financially do you want to um, do free returns uh, to the customer or does does the customer pay a certain cost to do to do the return uh, uh, so so again it will depend on your business what you are comfortable financially with uh, and of course the ideal situation is always if if someone is able to offer free returns then then uh, it, it it removes the risk uh, in the mind of the customer and they can uh, they're more able to freely uh, shop from your uh, business and that that may also help you to grow the business uh. minimizing returns there there are certain strategies and tactics that you can do uh, that may help you to minimize returns um, again you have to see what works best for your business but these are just some best practices so having high quality images and descriptions on your website um, if the item that you're selling requires has certain size conditions um, uh, you can have some fitting tools these days uh, are becoming more and more available where people can just by using the cameras uh, able to try out uh, different items like you know uh, I, I wear uh, glasses and things like that. Customer reviews are very, very important. Uh, so <clears throat> when people purchase items, they read customer reviews, they read negative reviews, and the business should promote that because that helps other people in choosing the right items. So if, if you make it easier for people to choose the right item to buy, then you will minimize returns in that way. Choosing the right packaging. so when the item is shipped out to the customer the the packaging doesn't break uh, the item is not damaged so that's always important having a really great customer service uh, where people can uh, call and ask questions before making the purchase uh, and also uh, be able to ask questions afterwards that that will help uh, minimizing returns um, the ideal situation would be to to get the order right the first time so if everything is accurate uh, what the customer has ordered uh, there are no errors that would also help to minimize returns there are situations where you know people the customers who are serial returners so <clears throat> it's not the business fault but customers have a habit and i've come across in my experience uh, people like this where you know they would just buy lots of things and then return it and the, and this is just a pattern like they're not really interested in keeping an item they will just they just purchase and return it and that that's a huge cost to the customer and so when you come across customers like this then you figure out a way whether you want to uh, ban such people or find certain um, processes to deal with people like this um, make return easy for customers and that that is again to leave a good shopping experience for customers and uh, over time you will uh, see different things you know you will uh, see if a certain product has a higher return rate then you you know try to analyze why that is the case and try to fix that and 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 in those ways over time figure out ways to minimize returns so finally, I'm going to talk very briefly about a couple of things uh, that will help you to um, give that wow experience to the customers. And again, the idea of all these operational topics is to be able to ship out the item to the customer 
uh, as quickly as possible and as accurately as possible and really give the customer a great experience uh, after placing the order so that you know it generates loyalty and trust and and uh, and and makes them a long term customer so unboxing experience a lot of uh, businesses these days are really uh, going the extra mile uh, to delight the customer with their packaging uh, so you know the whole packaging uh, and you may have seen on youtube you know uh, unboxing experience and these kind of videos where people it's, it's really an experience after they receive the package how they go about opening that box uh, that box may have different uh, design and elements of surprise and what uh, what this does is it it helps customers remember you for a longer time and uh, customers also share this on social media so it creates buzz for your business uh, some of the different things that you can do to uh, in the sh unboxing experience is uh, sometimes you will find samples of uh, of products uh, or, or little gifts, uh, thank you notes. Sometimes, uh, you know, one uh, company that is known to do this is um, well.ca in Canada. They, they were writing like handwritten thank you notes. Uh, you can put some educational materials inside the box. Um, you can put like coupon codes, things like this that would uh, help customer to bring back to your site and, and make uh, additional purchases. So, <clears throat> of course, you know, as a, as a startup business, uh, going this extra mile will have some additional cost involved. But um, uh, if you can do anything, I think that, that to, to delight the customer, I think that always goes, uh, that, that's always a good option. Finally, customer service is a big part of uh, running an e-commerce business. Um, and there are a few things that you can do in terms of um, providing great customer service to your customers so that it, uh, it has a great, it leaves a great shopping experience. Uh, one of the most important things is to have a frequently asked questions section on your site. So the questions that you get again and again, you have a section where you answer those questions. Uh, and this will minimize the customer service calls that you get, the questions that you get that you have to answer again and again, so that's helpful for your business also. Uh, create efficient processes for customer service. So if you have, um, if your business is growing, maybe you have a ticketing system that helps you to do customer service rather than just using email back and forth. Uh, be available on, on multiple channels. So these days, customers are using different channels for customer service purposes. Uh, people are using Twitter, Facebook, uh, chat, uh, website. So if it is possible for your business, uh, be available on the different channels to help the customers. Uh, again, it's about delighting the customer. Enable self-service. So if on your e-commerce website, if the customer can log in and they can check out the status of the order, they can check out the tracking number, these kind of things, uh, that also helps. Uh, create a personal experience. And I'm going to show you an example of that in a second. Uh, <clears throat> have customer reviews. Again, customer reviews help customers in, in making the right uh, choice of the product that, that they want to buy. Uh, improve response time. So uh, the better that you become uh, uh, in terms of answering questions over time, uh, you want to, you know, nobody likes when you, I think everyone has the experience of calling uh, your bank or your telephone company and waiting 30 minutes that, that leaves a really, really bad impression in the minds of the customer. So you want to have quick response times. Uh, and again, um, th there is no one size fit all. Uh, it's, it's a learning process. In your business, you will have certain learning process where you learn about things and you optimize your process and then uh, go and, and improve that. And finally, I want to talk about one case study. Um, and <clears throat> this business, Zappos.com, some of you may be familiar with it, some maybe not. This is actually a pretty big business in the US. And uh, they, they started out um, in 1999 with really nothing. And they grew up to be a pretty big business. Um, eventually, Amazon acquired them in 2009. So after 10 years, they grew pretty big. They were acquired for about a billion dollars. And they really built their business around this whole 
idea of operational efficiency, customer service, building a culture uh, around customer service. Uh, so in 1999, this business uh, started out uh, selling shoes and the founder basically uh, started out as a drop shipping business. So the founder, one of the people here on the left, um, he created a website, he went to the local shoe shops, uh, took pictures of different shoes, put it online, and every time he would get the order, he would just go to the shop and buy the, uh, buy the shoe and ship it out. And eventually, uh, doing this process, he realized that there is a big market for it, you know, shoe shopping online. And so he created a business out of it after getting some funding. And uh, <clears throat> in 2002, create a, created a, their own fulfillment center in partnership with UPS. And so coming together with this uh, shipping, uh, shipping service, they were able to really uh, optimize this shipping process uh, to the customers. In 2003, uh, they they tested with going from like a 60-day return policy to a 365-day uh, return policy, and that was their promise was free shipping and free return. So they realized that by even though it it uh, it created a lot more cost for them by having this policy, by having this promise that you can buy and you don't have to worry about returning and you can return it up to a year, uh, it, it really had a huge impact on customer loyalty, it had a, hum a huge impact on customer trust, and, and really built a long-term relationship with the customer. Uh, in 2004, after one year, they took this idea one step further, and they, they said that, you know, they, they created a 24-7 customer service, and they said, you know, there will be no script, uh, they wanted the customer service to be so personal, uh, and so great that anyone could call their business and it doesn't it did not have to be about you know buying a shoe and the customer service rep would actually talk to the person and there was no time limit on them so there are stories where and it created a huge buzz for their business where a customer called uh, customer service and they were talking like you know the the customer service helped them book a hotel and and book a you know um, order a pizza and things like that and it created such a buzz for them, even though this, this was a huge cost for the business that uh, it helped them to drive a lot of business. Then um, in the next few years, they really started focusing on this, creating a whole culture around customer service. So in, in terms of their recruitment process, uh, <clears throat> they had dual job interviews where one interview was about, can you do the job? But the second uh, interview was about having culture fit. Can you? are you the right person to for this business uh, and if you see like now these days uh, a lot of the businesses do this culture interview also and it's uh, it's actually uh, uh, adopted from this company and uh, so they they focused on culture so much that in their hiring process in the, the three week they they gave their uh, new hires three weeks of uh, customer service boot camp where the new hires would learn about culture, customer service, inventory management system. And at the end of the that, that once you have finished this training, they would actually give the person, you know, if, if, the, if the new hire didn't think that they were the right fit for the company, they would actually give them $100 to quit at the end. And they still have this policy. I think now they give up to a one month off salary for the person to, to quit. And the whole idea behind this is, is to find every person that is so uh, so fit and so aligned to their culture and their values that they, you know, it's, it's ultimately about providing that wow experience to the customer, uh, providing that and building that uh, customer happiness. And uh, <clears throat> and and they 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 followed on that, uh, and ultimately in two thousand and nine. Uh, they were uh, acquired by Amazon at that time. They were about $1 billion. And in 2015, they, they continued to grow. And now I think in 2015, they were about $2 billion. So you can see that starting from nothing, just by focusing on some of these aspects, the operational aspects and focusing on customer service and building customer happiness and loyalty, uh, even though there was a, a huge cost that went into the business to be able to provide that kind of experience, they really were able to build a long-term business. And if you think about companies like Amazon, 
uh, they have a similar philosophy with with their fast shipping and quick returns, uh, no questions asked returns, these kind of things. Uh, it's really designed to build that customer happiness and, and uh, customer loyalty and trust. So s something to think about when you're building your business is uh, you know focusing on customer and, and getting the customer happy by getting these operational processes right uh, would really help you to build a, a successful business. And uh, <clears throat> finally, uh, in conclusion, uh, that, that, that was really my conclusion is, you know, you want to build a business where your customer is happy because a happy customer will come and buy from you again and again. And a little bit about myself, as uh, Angela shared in the beginning, um, I have a few sites. Um, I'm doing a podcast right now, uh, which is on e-commerce, where I talk to successful e-commerce businesses. Uh, these are six-figure, seven-figure, eight-figure businesses, founders of these businesses, and they basically come and share how they started their business, their startup story, and also some of the strategies and tactics that they have used to grow their business. Um, you can also contact me anytime um, through my email if you need any help in regards to uh, e-commerce, digital marketing, product management. Um, uh, I'm happy to help anytime, and I have some social media. Uh, addresses there. So if you have any questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. Promotional packaging, I think uh, first, if, if you are creating your own brand, um, then first you will have to get it designed, I suppose, uh, that fits in with uh, your brand. Um, and then uh, there are, you can search online, uh, there are many businesses that, uh, uh, that, that can help you build the promotional uh, packaging. Uh, there are sites like Fiverr and Upwork.com um, where you can find a lot of people who will be able to help you just with the design process. Uh, to come up with the right uh, design and strategy for your packaging. But if you if you search online, you will be able to find there are specialized businesses that help uh, with the promotional packaging. Um, just, uh, just search on Google, um, or were you referring to upwork.com? It's U-P-W-O-R-K.com. It's basically a marketplace of uh, people that you can hire. Um, and you can also hire like marketing people and things like that, um, from other countries and it's, uh, more cost effective. Uh, so you can have people to work uh, for your business at a cheaper cost, but they're usually located in uh, other countries. <clears throat> 